Let's do this. Good evening. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to hear from local businesses that are closed down by Executive Order 2099 to understand the challenges they face and to send a message to St. Paul regarding the future. Starting in early September, when we were all moving more indoors, numbers of COVID-19 cases were trending upward. By the end of October, there were critical shortages in healthcare capacity. ICU beds were filling up, which means that the people necessary to provide care were near breaking point. Nurses, doctors, nursing assistants, respiratory therapists, housekeeping staff, human resources professionals, and everyone else were at their limit. People with severe COVID-19 were at risk of not getting the medical care that they need, the comprehensive, complete, full medical care that they need. Something had to be done to maintain the ability to provide care for those hardest hit by this disease. State, county, and local governments, along with school systems and individuals, were making adjustments to sl slow the spread of COVID-19. Governor Walls introduced Executive Order 2099, which took effect on Saturday, November the 21st. It take, if it takes an average of six days for someone infected with COVID to actually start to show symptoms, then we could say that the actual effect of the order would have hit on about November 27th, okay? If it takes six days, he shut things down, and at the end of the sixth day, on about the 27th of November is when it would have shown the effect of the shutdown. Well, in fact, new cases of COVID-19 started trending downward in Minnesota after about November the 15th, almost two weeks before the effect of EO 2019 showed up. New cases of COVID-19 have been trending downward in North Dakota since November 13th, in South Dakota since November 14th, in Iowa since November 5th, and in Wisconsin since November 13th. The curve is trending downward and it started before EO 2019 went into effect. Whether this is the normal life cycle of the virus or whether people are making adjustments along with schools, the other units of government with their own common sense, we don't know, but those are the numbers. Executive Order 2099 closed bars, restaurants, fitness centers, movie theaters, convention centers, and other venues where people gather. It ended athletic practice and competition among amateur youth and adults. Executive Order 2099 prohibits all social gathering with anyone outside your nuclear family, including planned or spontaneous events, indoors or outdoors. It includes a penalty provision that fines organizers of prohibited gatherings up to $3,000 and those who attend those gatherings up to $1,000. On November 24th, three days after the executive order went into effect, Governor Walls announced that he would work to pass a COVID-19 relief package. The legislature is likely to convene December the 14th, this coming Monday, to debate the passage of an economic relief package. The problem with this, though, is that business has had no revenue and they had to pay bills on December the 1st. They had employees who face an uncertain economic future going into the holidays. They have debt mounting with no faith that they will be able to reopen because there's a history of these executive orders being extended. They have vendors and there are other companies who depend on these closed businesses for their business. There was a mention of a fund of $10 million statewide to help small businesses to get through this. Enough to help about a thousand small businesses. It turns out there are over 10,000 eating and drinking establishments in Minnesota, which means 90% of them would go unfunded. They employ 275,900 people. That doesn't even include movie theaters. 275,900 people in the state. Well, if the current assistance is able to help 1,000 businesses and 90% go without, well, that means 248,310 people are going into the holidays with an unsure economic future brought about by Executive Order 2099 and the failure to pass the economic part of it, that is the dollars back to the businesses before this thing went into effect. So that's what we're up to, that's what we're here for. And, and we wanna hear from the businesses and there will be some other response from community members and elected officials coming out of this. This time I'm gonna call on Barry Wilford for your view from the chamber, also the work that you've done with businesses. Thanks Barry. Thank you, Mayor Gander. I really appreciate you putting this meeting together and I also appreciate your thorough job with all the statistics. You're, you're always a man of a great amount of information. I, the business community really appreciates that. Um, we also appreciate everything the city's done from grants to loans to listening to our stories tonight. 
Uh, we also very much appreciate our, appreciate our legislators, legislators being here, Mark and Deb, we appreciate you being here tonight as well. Um, it's been about three weeks now since the governor of Minnesota shut down a big segment of Minnesota businesses. He told us that this is a four week pause and we would be reopening in a month. The governor is a man of integrity and of his word and we expect this executive order will be lifted on the 18th and businesses will be allowed to reopen. That said, this shutdown and previous executive orders have had tremendous negative impact on the East Grand Forks business community. But don't just take my word for it. There's a nice representation of East Grand Forks businesses here tonight to share their stories. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Paul Gordy with the East Grand Forks EDA who has a few opening comments. Then we're gonna hear from some of these business folks who have been adversely affected. So Paul, if you could come up and make a couple opening comments. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor Gander, for setting up this meeting. Uh, the EDA appreciates the effort of you, Council President, President Olstead, and the City Council to assist local businesses during these stressful times. This has been a difficult year, and the EDA wants everything that can be done for our business community to be done. Not done to it, done for it. When businesses are closed by order of government, government has a duty to make them whole again. Tonight we'll hear only a few of the stories of our businesses. There are many, many more, and we've been talking to businesses all year, and we hear them, and, and it just tears you apart to hear their stories. What are we going to do to make things right for our businesses? Now we're going to introduce local businesses. Uh, the first person, the first people to talk are from Ember Cinema. It'll be Bob Moore and Penny Stay. Mask on, mask off. Off is good. Off. You can tap them off to speak. We like to see your lips moving. Good. <laughs> um, most of you know me. I own uh, Riverwalk Mall and River Cinema. We've been here 11 years, 12 including construction. Um, we built this business from the ground up. Um, theater is the intention I had with opening it. We've been in business 45 years in the theater business. And I, I think if you would have asked me a year ago if any of this could have happened, I would have told my children and everybody I know, no. Um, we're a private business. We, <laughs> we can't be closed down. And I'm not sure legally if we are closed down. But regardless, with the penalties and what we face, we're closed. Um, for my business, we worked very hard to get this thing going, as everybody in this room. And I would be lying if I said I wasn't angry to sit and watch something that I built for my family as a legacy being destroyed for a politicized, my terms, disease. Um, we've been through many other diseases. I don't remember ever having to be told I had a close. Um, is it tough? Yeah, sometimes it is. N1, H1N1, yeah, it was tough. First time we had to install sanitizers everywhere and do everything. But I'm going to tell you, when we came here and we currently draw, used to, um, 450 to 375,000 in our absolute worst year to East Grand Forks. And I have many, many businesses surrounding us that have built there because we're there and for that extra traffic and they're suffering. They're not suffering, they're dying. And they don't have anything they can do about it or say about it. We just have to do it. We have one over on the river right now protesting to the fact that she just for the first time in her life is gonna break the law and she's gonna try to open because she told me yesterday, I'm gonna lose it. I gotta go down swinging. 
And I think a lot of us in this room are feeling the same. I don't know what to tell you. Um, the Riverwalk Mall, we talked last time you were here. Mm -hmm. I have 14 tenants. I'm 100% full. We're ready to build out and we're still ready to build out and expand. But you've just put it backwards three to four years. If, when we reopen, people come back. If they're not scared to death to move and do something. You know, what choices do I have right now? I mean, we had gone through this when he reopened, but our theatrical movie companies wouldn't release prints because of the virus and no attendance. Theaters were still closed in the major metropolitan areas like New York, California. They wouldn't allow any theaters open. So therefore, why are they going, those are our biggest markets. They want to release the product. They can't, it's stupid, it's suicide to them to release movies they spent millions of dollars on and have no guarantee of revenue. Um, I don't know, I really am tired of it. I mean, you know, we've lost $8,000 this year, 800000 it's out the window. I can't get it back. And we've been fortunate to get 250000 in grants. You know what a building that takes up a city block, what it costs to just try to leave it open? And the city was gracious. I mean, they helped us as well. They gave us some grants as part of that, and we've also taken some loans. But it gives me more debt, $280,000 more debt. That's not a, <laughs> I appreciate it, but it's not a major help. I would rather open, let me, let me take and do what we do and figure it out. We did, we went through all this, sluggish. I opened way too soon, I didn't even have movies. We, we took and we had to run DVDs, if you want to call it that, old movies. and. We still try to figure it out. We got some things going along. So what else can we do? We come up with the idea, we're gonna rent auditoriums for a hundred bucks. A whole theater auditorium at your discretion for a hundred bucks. And you can take and bring up to 40 people from your family and watch a movie. Eat, do what you wanna do, your space, safe. We had it worked out. We had 30 some we, we, this is our prime season right now when he shut us down. We have next week is all we got left and then nothing comes out for us. What, are you going to open me up in January? There's nothing here. You know, so that's insult on top of insult. We had 25 to 30 private theaters rented. And we had the call with two days to take and shut down. And then he figured out where we were making money and stopped. Private parties, everything we could do. He gives me <laughs> concessions to sell. Yeah, that's going to pay the bills. Got to come to the door. You got to pick them up and get some concessions. But you know what it felt like to work so hard and all the phone calls we had to make to get these private parties set up? to try to make a little. We haven't broke even for a long, long, long time. Like I say, we've lost a lot of money. So I told you how many people we had, you know, 450 to 350,000, 375, our worst year, you know. Well, this year we're looking at 56,000 people for the year. That doesn't just affect me. That affects them and everybody behind me. You stop bringing the traffic to town, but one of my biggest things is, Jesus, guys, let us open. Let us figure it out, do our thing. I mean, I'm going to lose tenants if I don't have foot traffic. I'm the only mall in this entire region that is 100% full, and I can't guarantee how long that's going to happen. If you don't have traffic, how are you going to keep people? So... You know, open us. That's all I ask. Leave us alone. Just stay out of our life. We can handle our own business. 
and we've done it for 45 friggin years and it's worked fine and yeah we got to figure it out somehow I'll run an outdoor picture on my theater I'll I'll do something but I can't be told when I'm ready to start it up that I'm closed again this is the second time first time was only for two weeks <laughs> but three months later we we got to reopen now it's four weeks and nobody in this room believes we're going to open again until after January and all my message is please leave us alone honor <laughs> your word and reopen us no more excuses no more I'm done I... you guys give it to them Thanks, Bob. Bob, I appreciate that. Um, next, can we have uh, Nate uh, Shepard from the Blue Moose and Pat's here also, Pat Beaupre. I'd um, like to welcome Nate to the podium next. Thank you, Barry. Hey guys, I'm Nate with the Blue Moose. You know, just a little uh, background. Um, Pat and I started buying the Blue Moose around 11 years ago. And, um, you know, we bought a chunk and then we bought another chunk, another chunk. And that has always been my dream. I remember my uh, high school English teacher yelling at me, Mr. Shepard, what are you going to do with your life? And I said, I'm going to own a restaurant, be a chef, you know, and, and we did it, you know, um, finally, we were super excited for, you know, January 1st of 2020 to come around because that's when we finished um, buying out the three original people. So this is our first year of, of full ownership, you know, took out big loans to, uh, to get that ownership. And uh, what do we have? Three months? And then we got shut down? You know, um, so that's just kind of a little bit of the backstory. One thing that grinds my gears is you drive to the south end of Grand Forks, and we, we're in this, we, we're the have-nots and they're the haves. You know what I mean? You drive by, you know, what we call the old movie theater that no one goes to, and there's 50, parking, 50 cars in the parking lot now, you know. Um, I think it hurts us more that we're, um, uh, we're a border city. You know, um, because if people want to go out and eat, well, they just go to Grand Forks, you know, and I should stop doing it. But sometimes I find myself just driving around town looking at what's in other people's parking lots. You know what I mean? And it just pisses me off. I shouldn't do it, but I do it. And um, so that, I think, is a big issue. Um, you know, personally, you know, um, my son lost his job because my son worked at the Blue Moose as a busboy, young kid coming up, hard worker. And... He had got a car from his grandpa, but he's like, you know what, I got some money saved. And then he went and bought, you know, a little, little $13,000 car. You know what I mean? Well, now he's struggling to pay that. So now we are struggling to pay that, you know. Um, I personally know of three guys that work with me that are facing eviction, you know. Um, every day they're like, yeah, man, can I get some more hours? Can I get some more hours? You know, my, my landlord's coming to my place. He's telling me I'm going to be living at the mission, blah, blah, blah. And... I'm like, dude, I can only give you as much as I can. You know, the first round with the Triple P money, we were able to keep everyone employed. Um, there was some forethought into closing everything down. And this one was just a whim. It seems like, oh, shut them down. You know, I had ordered, on average, we'll do about 800 pounds of turkey for Thanksgiving dinner. And um, so, you know, pairing that back, knowing, you know, we're not as busy and, and this and that. So I ordered 500 pounds. Well, but you can't order that two days before you need it because it's all frozen. You got to thaw it, you got to marinate it, you got to brine it, all this sort of jazz. Well, then he shuts us down and I'm sitting on 500 pounds of partially thawed turkey. So where's the foresight? Like you were cases so much lower two weeks before that they couldn't give us any sort of advance on that, like to let us know, like, hey guys, just so you know, this might be coming. The first one, Sunday morning, I'm driving to work and Walls comes on and says, I'm not shutting down restaurants. So we go in, Sunday morning is a big prep heavy day to get ready for the week. I ordered $12,000 worth of food, and then 7 o'clock that Monday, he shuts us down. Like, can you give us some warning so we can stop prepping food? We can tell the guys, hey, don't go out and buy that new car because you might not have hours next week. You know, to give us some warning to, to get that done right. Um, you know, and one thing is, like, the Blue Moose has gone above and beyond for regulations. You know, we're a very large restaurant. We can spread people out and still be profitable and still do our business well, keep everybody safe. Um, 
but then when he, when he puts the face mask mandate in, you know, that costs us two to $300 a week in face masks, you know, for about the first month, month and a half, when people were getting into it and, you know, towards the end, everyone had a face mask. But where was the support on that? You know, they couldn't have come out and said, hey, you know, here's, here's a few cases of face masks to get you through, to get you going, you know, but nothing on that. Um, you know, one thing that always gets on me is like, how many paychecks has Walls missed? You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's so goddamn easy to sit there and say, you know what? Uh, you guys are shut down. You know, your employees are going to be fired. Your employees are going to be evicted. But, um, oh, it's Friday. I get my paycheck. You know what I mean? Like, if, if his paycheck was related to, um, you know, everybody else's, I think that might be a different story. Um, let's see here. And then to get a little bit on, you know, I don't want to sound like that conspiracy nut, but like when you give away some freedoms, sometimes you don't get them all back, you know, and at what point do, you know, like say the next uh, big coming of the end of the world is a locust plague. All right. So they shut down restaurants because we produce garbage that they eat. So now they're shut down again. You know what I mean? So at what point is it like, well, it's a free business. You know, I pay my taxes. I pay my licensing fees. Why am I being shut down? So that, um, I always got on my nerves, and um, but anyway, it's just sort of one thing after another, you know. Um, uh, I should have put a list because I put this list one time. I'm having a pity party, just just one thing right after another. Like especially when uh, the flood came and they closed the walls and we could only do takeout, and then they had to drive around the entire city to come get a Bourbon Street pasta, you know. And and it was just uh, one thing after another, but. Um, Anyway, like, um, like Bob had said, like we want to see him honor his word and open us back up on the 18th. And business isn't going to be booming. You know, we're not going to be packed. People are still, you know, you still have a percentage of people that aren't looking to go out into public and they don't want to be in that space. Um, but, I mean, give us that opportunity to employ our staff to be like, you know what, yeah, here, here's some more hours for you guys so you don't get evicted, you know. Um, but um, oh, I had another thing. You know, that's all I, uh, that's about all I got. Thank you very much for letting me talk. Corey Knopf was flying back in. He has, he owns several businesses in town and his flight was delayed in Denver. Uh, he owns Anytime Fitness. That's the gym that's closed. He owns Cherry Berry, that's a restaurant that's basically closed. And he owns the Holiday Gas Station. So he had a lot of comments to make about how this has affected him and his businesses. Closing the, the gym, closing the Cherry, uh, the cherry Berry has been, uh, has had a large impact upon his businesses over at the Holiday Inn and that, and that location. Uh, the next person we're going to have speak is not on the list. It's going to be uh, Sherry Irons, who is with Mike's Pizza. Sherry, are you ready? Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Sherry Arnes from Mike's Pizza. Um, let me tell you a little story about Mike's Pizza. We actually have been here since 1964. Um, we're one of the longest restaurants in East Grand Forks, locally owned the entire time. Um, I started at Mike's Pizza when I was a teenager, back in high school. 10 years later, after loving my job, loving the community, um, liking the business so well, loving customer service, I decided to buy it. So I've actually owned it since, mm, since I was 28, I think. I'm now 48, so you can do the math. Um, I have to say, throughout all the years, I've loved my job, I've loved the community. Um, I've never had an issue with anybody or the government or anything going on in town. Um, but this year has been a struggle bus for us. We are very slow, um, along with everyone else who is hurting also. Uh, 
I have to say that Mike's is doing everything we can to be safe with all of the restrictions and everything, but we do need to open. We do need to be able to serve customers inside. We can do it safely. We can do it um, with all of the other restrictions, but we need to open. Um, otherwise, we may not make it. One of the oldest restaurants in town, locally owned, might not make it through the year. So I wasn't really prepared to speak today, but I wanted everyone to hear our story. So I, I'm glad that you're all here listening to me. Can I, can I ask you one question? Yeah. Um, how, how are you still serving um, we're doing takeout take, orders? We're doing takeout and delivery. Okay. Um, since the shutdown, I probably turn away um, six to eight tables a day that come in, not knowing that Minnesota has shut down since we are a border community. So we have lots of people coming in for lunch buffet, lots of people coming in at night, college students coming in at night wanting to eat inside, and I have to turn them away. It was heartbreaking a month ago. Um, we have a staff of 23 people, and I laid everyone off except for five. So a month before Christmas to tell all the employees that have worked for you from years, 20 years employees, that they had to be laid off. This is the first time I've ever had to do that. So. Well, I, it's awful to let one go. Right, it is. Without, yeah, yeah. And it wasn't just, um, you know, the regular college students that you get in every year. It was family members and people who worked for me for years and years and years who I grew up with working at Mike's Pizza. So. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Um, let's have Kristen from Mama Maria speak right now. Uh, I can see that she's on here. Uh, Kristen, would you like to tell your story to everybody? Hi, guys. Sure. Yeah. All right, so uh, thanks for having me. Uh, Mom Maria's was actually my first job when I was 16 years old. Um, I started at Mom Maria's as a dishwasher and uh, continued to work at Mom Maria's on and off and um, actually went and worked at River Cinema because a lot of my friends worked there and that was a great time in my life too. You know, I had a lot of fun there. So it's really nice now I get to work with Penny and Bob in a different capacity than I did when I worked at the movie theater. Um, so when Mama Maria's was um, going to close um, about a year and a half ago now, uh, I kind of stepped in and didn't want to see it close because it was really dear to my heart. It was uh, my first job ever. And so I took on the role of trying to figure out a way where I could run Mama Maria's myself and work here. So, um, when he is same as Sherry from Mike's Pizza, basically, I decided to, you know, pursue the dream of owning the restaurant that I worked at. And uh, I started working here. And the, when we opened, the bridge was closed downtown because they were doing construction. So the theater was slow. We were slow with, you know, everything coming from the Grand Forks traffic usually for us. We had a hard time with that to start with. And then... Um, in March of that year, I bought it this past year. Um, that's when the COVID hit. So it was between the bridge and COVID and so many other factors that both myself and the theater traffic kind of slowed down. So um, a lot of the people who come to Mama Maria's are people who are waiting to go to a movie and want to come have a drink or you know, want to eat before a movie for a date night. So that also slowed us down. Um, so with no new movies or anything coming out like that, it's really hard for us to keep the traffic going here. As, you know, Nate said too, you know, the, the theater is a draw to East Grand Forks. So it's hard for us if there's no movies coming out and the theater's not open, there's no, you know, real draw to East Grand Forks. Um, and, you know, I understand the Minnesota numbers with COVID and stuff like that, but honestly, it, the first shutdown was pretty pointless for us because we weren't Minneapolis. It's, we're not getting the same numbers as Minneapolis was in the spring. And now that it kind of ramped up, it's like the second shutdown is just really hurting us. 
So I don't, it, it, it's really hard to see a future for Mama Maria's when we're shut down. There's no feeder traffic because they're shut down. It's, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful for the Moors for helping us out and keeping us here as tenants, but it's really hard to see a future with the shutdown. And if we don't back, open back up, I don't know what's gonna happen. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I have a letter from the boardwalk I'm going to read. Um, they are unable to be here tonight because at 4 o'clock this afternoon, they decided to open their business. And they are actually manning the ship over there right now. Uh, Dear Mayor Gander, Boardwalk Enterprises, which owns the Boardwalk building, is liable for mortgage payments on this building, which houses two restaurants, the Boardwalk Bar and Grill and Little Bangkok. The Boardwalk building makes monthly mortgage payments of $14,000, along with heat, lights, sewage, water, repairs, maintenance, and yearly real estate taxes of $19,500. The loss to the Boardwalk Enterprises is over $250,000 to, to, as of this date this year. Um, this can be itemized if needed. However, when you receive no lease payment and pay the bills, it does not take very long to go through $250,000. Boardwalk Bar and Grill has had similar losses, but less money. Um, its labor force is gone. The real question is, can the business dream, or can the business ever dream of starting up again? Um, and will there even be customers? Um, again, the bar has lost over $150,000 and can never recapture it. It's impossible to shut down, open up, shut down, and move forward with everyone scared. The arbitrary shutting down selected businesses is definitely wrong. Chances of the boardwalk building and the boardwalk bar and grill surviving as is, is not practical. Trying to get assistance is not probable. To go to the city, then go to the state, then go to the national, the result is the same. One way or another, the taxpayer ends up being taxed. I cannot participate in the video conference tonight. Uh, boardwalk bar has been placed in a situation of having to defy the Minnesota state closed order. However, um, other courts in the U. However, other courts in the United States have provided rulings of it not being constitutional. The city should stand behind this if the boardwalk bar does so. Thank you, Jane Moss owner and Dan Staus owner of the boardwalk enterprises. Um, at, <laughs> at this point, I would like to introduce Gary Shields with the Eagles Club, and I believe Gary is online. You can maybe put your video. Good evening. On. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you okay. Yes. All right. Hey, Barry, um, could you step back up to the podium for a second, real quick? I don't know if you have a microphone in front of you there. I do, yes. Okay. So, first and foremost, I want to thank everybody for allowing me to be on this call. Um, Barry, I've, I've been out of town quite a bit trying to you know, save my business and I have multiple businesses. Obviously the Eagles Club is an investment that myself and two other investors purchased um, to save the Eagles Club. And uh, we're about to make another serious injection. Barry, has the chamber come out with uh, uh, an official statement regarding the closure uh, in East Grand Forks or can we, you know, we're all in the same canoe going down some rough rapids right now. Well, I, I think, we, you know, I think boat. that's the reason we're here tonight is to hear from businesses. Obviously, we're supportive of trying to be reopened as quickly as possible in the state of Minnesota. Do you think it's wrong? Do you think it's wrong what's happening right now, sir? What do you mean by wrong? Do you think what, <laughs> well, uh, the, the, what, state? The, major, what, what, the, what the state has inflicted personally leading our chamber what is your position, sir? Well, I, I think we're in a very difficult position because we all try to be law-abiding citizens at the same time. This is creating undue hardship and it's, it's really having a negative effect on business people. And, and I think that's all, that's evidence here tonight, which is why I think it's important that we hear from the business voices and get this word to St. Paul and get this word to our governor. So I thank you for participating and I look forward to hearing your comments on this. Okay, Barry, I just did have one more question, if I could, sir. Um, hey, Barry. Yeah, I'm still here. 
Sorry about that. So if you were to get in front of uh, Governor Waltz, um, would you tell him unequivocally that personally you think that he's making a big mistake personally? I, I can tell you that I did have a conversation early on in this process um, as part of our state association group. And I asked him specifically when he felt we would be reopening the first time. And at that time, he did not have an answer. So I, I guess I, th that simple fact that I've been involved in this process really from day one, I think speaks to the fact the chamber is extremely interested in, in, this, in this issue and feels that Governor Walls needs to take some action to help the business community. Thank you, Barry. So I think as a group, we need to take that as, as Barry's just as upset as we are. He hasn't had the financial suffrage that we have had but I think we can all agree that Barry is basically telling us that he thinks this is completely wrong. And I think that's how we should all take this in the room. Nowhere in this conversation has he said he thinks it's right. So thank you, Barry, for supporting us. Um, Mr. Johnson, um, were you able to approach the podium, sir? Can you hear me, Barry? Oh, yes, sir. If you have a microphone, that's great. Yeah. Sir, I'd like to ask you the same question. Why I'm doing this is, is I don't want to waste everybody's time um, I'm listening to everyone's story and they're long time vested in the trenches in their businesses. Myself, Mike Marcotte, Vern Gernovich came in as investors to save a club in East Grand Forks. Um, I used to live in East Grand Forks and I have a business in East Grand Forks, two locations. Uh, Mr. Johnson, if you were to get before Governor Waltz, would you tell him unequivocally that what he's doing is wrong, sir? Absolutely, Gary, absolutely. Okay. You know, I wish I would have got that answer a few minutes ago. Um, I understand political positions. That's all I have for you, sir. Thank you for your honest answer. I am not going to get into specifics about the hardships of the Eagle Club, but I will tell you that we have been contacted by multiple restaurants and bars that want to partner with us. What I want to focus on is a hybrid business. The Eagles Club has 10,000 square feet to offer to the community. Kristen made a good point about the movie theater, what an asset it is to our community. But if Mr. Moore were to win the lottery and decide to close his business down, we would still have to operate. Penny and Mr. Moore have done and contributed more to our community than most people know. I have a nonprofit business and I can tell you that they have donated tons of money God bless you both for your commitment to the community. We as a club offer tremendous services for social distancing for weddings. We have over eight conferences booked going into next summer. So we need to keep going and we are gonna keep going. We need to create a hybrid in our club. We've been notified by multiple businesses that are saying we're going down we're gonna to try to partner with whoever, whatever, but we're gonna make this shake out. But if we can't ask questions and get a straight answer by the people that represent our chamber, our legislature, if we can't get a straight answer because they're afraid to answer the question straight out, we need to replace them. And we need to get somebody in here that's gonna stand up for us and not dance around. I talked to Jane Meyer today. I saw the post. The first words out of her mouth were, people are sick, depressed. We can all tell our stories and I'm gonna listen to everybody's story because I wanna give them the time. But I will say this, it's time to take action. You can take all these comments and go back there, but if you're not gonna stand in front of the governor and you're not gonna wave your finger at him, and explain to him that this has to change unequivocally, then there's a problem. One final comment and I'll get off it. I did receive a, a, a notice today that, I correct me if I'm wrong, Barry, but mask mandate extended to January 18th in North Dakota, 10 p.m. bar closing extent, extended until January 8th in North Dakota. Is that correct, sir? Barry's not here. Barry is not aware of that. Okay, so let's say that's true. Let's say this was posted by a, a, a manager of a club over at the Can-Ad Inn. 
It just said mass mandate extended to January 18th, 10 p.m. bar closing extended until Jan Jul January 8th. If that's the case, through all of the trial and tribulation, if this is true, wouldn't North Dakota be saying we need to shut down? I think Governor Waltz has missed the mark. I don't think he understands the severity of what we're going through and going and telling him our story is only going to be as effective as the people that march down there. Mr. Johnson, Barry, I'd be glad to jump in that vehicle and go down there and wave my finger. Thank you for your time. Thank you. At this point, our next person to talk is Ben Gregwire, who has Waves Float Center. Uh, Waves is a very different business, and it is located in the mall. No, oh, you can take your mask off. Yes. <laughs> I, I wear this with pride. <laughs> um, I'm um, Ben Gregoire. Uh, I run uh, Waves Float Center in... Um, Riverwalk Center. Uh, I've uh, started building my business four years ago, uh, right around this time. Um, it is a unique business. It's it's weird. It's uh, sensory deprivation tanks. It's um, but it's a uh, it's a wellness relaxation business that I believe works. I know works. There's there isn't a lot of um, there is a, a lot of interesting science that shows that it helps people reduce stress, reduce anxiety, help with mental health problems. Uh, I mean, it's not a cure or anything, but it's, it definitely does do something, and it works. Um, this, <clears throat> this is our fourth year running, um, and it's the first year that we've ever had to take out any type of loans from a bank. Um, we, Bob was gracious enough to help us build our space uh, when we first opened. We did not have a lot um, to, of ability to acquire capital and he helped us do that and we really appreciate it. Um, but this is the first time we've ever had to take out a loan and now we have $44,000 worth of debt and, and we lost $41,000 this year compared to last year. Um, the year before that, it's $62,000. Um, it's my wife and I that run this business. I work there for 80 to 90 hours a week every day um, for three years, and then I, I was forced to quit. Um, right now, this executive order does not affect me. The state said that no, now you guys are personal services. You're not affected by this version of this shutdown. I was for the first one. Um, but it doesn't matter. Everyone thinks I'm closed anyway. Um, nobody's coming. I've sold four gift cards this year. Um, I've, I normally sell over 100 by now. Um, my memberships that I have where people will come frequently has dropped down to 20 people. I had 100. Um, I have been working for free. I have not paid myself I, besides like buying gas and uh, some odds and ends um, all year long. Um, I have not paid for my house uh, because I, I was able to get a forbearance from my mortgage company, but that is expiring soon. And now I have loans from the, the city of East Grand Forks that we, that we got in the summer. We, rebuilt our two float spaces to accommodate for COVID um, problems. We upgraded our sanitation system. We made the system impossible for any like bacteria or viruses or anything to live in it. Um, we had the same sanitation system that NFL uh, is in NFL, NFL um, facilities. Um, we got nice stuff, but now I don't have I don't have anybody coming in. Nobody's buying any gift cards. I'm, I'm just working for free. I'm, well, not ri I'm paying to go to work. I, I, I have a job, but I'm just paying, well, about three grand 
every month to make about $1,000, and slowly my, my loan money is going down that I have available to me, and, um, and at some point I have to, like, do I just give the money back to the city and do the responsible thing and just close my business? Um, because um, I certainly don't want my name dragged through the paper like I know this city loves to do to people. Um, because, uh, because we can't make a, a loan payment. I mean, I could continue to operate. Um, I could scrape by if I could live in my building. If I could sleep there, if I could have my kids there, I could do that. But I mean, I can't, I can't have two businesses. Um, I mean, I, I'm all for picking up for, you know, picking yourself up by your bootstraps and all that type of uh, work, but I'm all out of straps. And uh, I mean, I announced that I'm gonna close at the end of this month because I, I just can't continue to work for free. Um, it's, it's making it incredibly difficult to um, do personal services because uh, you become resentful that um, you, they're paying 50 bucks or maybe 30 bucks to do something and I know that I'm paying 45 for that time because all I do, um, what I do is I sell time to people um, in a very unique space. It's a, I have two, I have four soundproof rooms um, with two with sensory deprivation tanks in it, one with a sauna. My friends in other cities that run float centers in this industry, they are crushing it right now, <laughs> in, uh, selling gift cards. They are making money in Wisconsin. They're making money uh, in <clears throat> Indiana, in, in all sorts of conservative kind of weird places that you wouldn't think sensory deprivation tank places would be. That, I mean, they are incredibly popular on the West Coast. People are booked solid all the time. It's moving inward. Uh, but, I don't know. I, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I have $44,000 worth of debt. And no, I mean, there's no way I can resell the time that I just lost. Because I'm, I'm, anyway, I'm, I ramble and rant. <laughs> Can I ask you, um, what you do, does it help like autistic children? Um, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I've never been in that year. It, 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 so. it certainly could. It would really depend okay. um, on, the, on the person. Um, and, but if they have a, a sensory issue, um, that could be um, a thing that can be useful. It would be something you'd maybe want to try. Um, but. I mean, it does help more for anxiety. That's where most of the research is shown because anxiety comes with basically just living. Um. Well, the way our life is going right now, I would think you'd be full because I think we have a lot of um, people that are very anxious and really stressed. So, yeah. I, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. we're not really a wellness town. We're more of a drink your problems away town. <laughs> um, and that is becoming a problem. We heard that this morning, didn't we? Um, Senator Johnson. I'm certainly trying to, I don't want to make huge changes, but I'm certainly trying to bring something cool to this space. I mean, before I did this, I worked at Microsoft. I could have just left. I'll, just like all of the rest of my friends. I stayed. I'm, I'm, I'm from here. We're glad you stayed. We just got to figure it out. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Um, we have three more businesses that uh, want to address the group. Next up is Justin from the Spud. <laughs> um, wow, yeah. I didn't write anything to be here, to tell you the truth. Um, I think the, the way that I wanted to actually speak has changed five times since I've been sitting in this room, to tell you the truth. Um, you know, I wasn't going to say exactly how we got to, to be who we are, but, you know, if anybody is going to listen to this, if, if anybody listens to you guys, you know, thank you for being here, by the way. Um, 
you two. Um, this does reach anywhere to the governor, who's he's ultimately responsible for this. I think it is imperative that he hears from the people. I mean, he needs to he needs to hear these stories. And uh, if I'm the first one that starts crying, I apologize. <laughs> um, Don't apologize. I think you'll be the last. So, uh, three years ago, my stepdad came to me and uh, he asked if uh, there was anything that we could do as a family. Um, I've been in the restaurant industry for 15 years and opened my first business with some partners in town and that partnership you know dissolved and people part ways and everything else so he asked me at that time if I thought that there was anything we could do because my little brothers had started working for us and um, I said I wasn't sure I wasn't sure I'd have to get kind of a feel for what the community is as a whole I spent my 20s in Fargo so coming back home um, by the time I was close to 30, it was, it was just a different environment. So I had to kind of see what, what, the, what the landscape was for the hospitality industry. And uh, a couple years passed, some things um, manifested. And we got to a point one day, about a year and a half ago, a friend of mine and I were uh, kind of joking around about the idea of putting a little hole in the wall bar right. behind where the recyc recycling center is now, right before the Louis Murray Bridge, which... Literally a hole in the wall. Literally. <laughs> literally. <laughs> but uh, right behind where the, the last Spud Bar used to, used to sit. And it was actually my friend Justin's idea, and he said he called the Spud Junior. Just have it be small, just like JL Beers is, and, and just kind of this, this town bar. And it, was, it was a joke. You know, we, we were joking. And it just kind of kept building. As friends who were entrepreneurs, it was... You know, you have a beer here and there, and you just keep firing things back and forth. And I got to a point one day where I was like, geez, this really, this, this honestly could be something if, if it ever came true. And uh, just so happened, Tau Garden had closed, and I was driving by board one day, and I saw a for lease sign that I didn't see before on the space that we occupy now, and uh, just called on a whim. No intentions of really making this thing happen. It was still just, you know, I had some time to kill. I'd never been in the building. One of the oldest buildings left in this town. So I, was like, I just kind of want to look around and see what's going on. And the landlord said, yeah, meet me over there. So we met half an hour later and I walked through and it looked like they just shut the lights off and walked out the door. There was, there was uh, silverware still on the tables and, and everything else. And I, so then, you know, the ideas start to fly as I'm sure you guys know how that always goes. And uh, I just started asking questions and, you know, what's, what do you think of for a lease? What do you think of for a term? And, and Everything he said back to me, I just kept going, this could, this could really happen. This could happen. So we decided to do it and created the menu and, um, you know, did everything that we had to do to, to start the business. It's third or fourth that I've done now. Um, but it was kind of exciting because it was going to be a family business. And uh, opened our doors on January 15th. And we were open for two months, and then this stuff happened. Um, I was scared, as I'm sure everybody else was. I've been doing this a long time too, so I kind of thought, well, you know, I've been around the community for a little while, I'm from here, hopefully I can do what I can marketing-wise, and hopefully I'm as good as I think I am, that we can, we can find a way to navigate through this. And uh, we have. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, we're doing this with the idea that we don't know when it's gonna end. And, We've gotten the same support that everybody else has gotten as far as uh, the resources that were available to us. But it's never been anywhere close to enough. Um, the PPP pro program, <laughs> my banker put it to me, uh, probably the, the best way I've ever heard put is, you know, it, it allowed us to maintain maybe longer than we could have without it, which I will for sure say. But the point of it was, to use the businesses as an unemployment agency. It wasn't to help us. It wasn't to put capital in the account to make sure that you can pay those bills. It was to pay the employees so they didn't overrun the state. And looking back, that's exactly what it did. Because if we wanted to keep the money and use it for goods, it was a loan. But if we just used it for payroll, then 
it was forgiven. Um, and initially it was eight weeks, and Pat and I had this conversation right around the same time. We knew right away we had to get rid of it in eight weeks. Well, then the seventh week, they extended it to 26. And we went, what? So we got an okay amount of money, and if we would have been able to stretch it to 26 weeks, it would have completely transformed how we did business and how we sustained. But what do you do? You pivot, and you try and find ways to, to make it work. And that's what we did. And I, to this day, I don't know. I, I don't know how we made it. I really don't. Um, this community. The amount of support that I hear every day. Unbelievable. Everybody wants to support everybody. And I guarantee Ben's going to get a lot more support tomorrow. I promise you that. Um, but the, the genuine outpour when people know you're in trouble, it's powerful. It really is. But It's not always enough when there's no end in sight. And that's the trouble that we're in now. And we talk about the extensions and how they say one thing and then they change it to another. One example I'll give is we knew this was going to happen, right? This, this lady shut down. We knew, we knew a little bit in advance. So one day, myself and one of my managers were sitting probably about two days before he was about to announce and we knew it was coming. And we said, well, how can we find a way to still do outdoor dining in the winter? <laughs> Is anybody else thinking about it? Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. How do we do it? And we were tossing around ideas and we thought about enclosing our patio with wood and ventilating it, making sure that the top was still exposed so there was free airflow. We had all these different things. And finally he goes, why don't we go across to Cabela's, see if they can sell us some ice houses or if they want to do some co-promotion. So we did, walked across and we said, hey, we'd like to do some outdoor dining and we'd love to, to use your product. What can you do for us? And they gave us a ridiculous deal and signed up to buy six ice houses. <laughs> we were going to put them right outside underneath our awning and we were going to heat them, make sure the vents were open, make sure there was light in there and we were going to do outdoor dining. And we thought that we, at that point, were the two smartest people that we'd ever met. <laughs> And uh, we celebrated for two days in the one ice house that we were able to purchase because the other ones had to be ordered. So we were sitting out there, we had the whole setup, and we were having beers. And the day that the, uh, the, day the order was sent down, um, you know, we knew it was coming, so I really didn't think anything of it. It was about 7 o'clock at night, we were having some beers. And my wife texted me, and she texted me the order and a handful of expletives that were behind it. And I read on it, and it specifically said no outdoor dining. And in that moment, when I told my manager that, you, you probably never seen two grown men just fall from everything so fast in your life. That was going to be what saved us. Because we didn't know if we could endure a second round. We didn't. And uh, that, that's what we thought was going to save us. And when we saw that, we... It was at that point where you just you want to just pack it all up and walk away because at what point you know you think you're ahead of it a little bit and you're going to gain a little bit of an edge, and he finds a way to take that away from you too. And uh, I made a Facebook post a couple days later because we got we posted it that we were going to do it and we got a lot of responses, ton. I mean it was it was awesome, and we had people calling wanting to reserve them and everything else. And the next day, I wasn't sure if I was going to do it, but I just, I put it out there and I just said, hey, you know, because of, of how this thing was written, we can't do this. To be honest, we're not sure if we're going to survive. So, you know, we thank everybody for the things that they've done. And if we don't see you again, when the doors reopen, just know that we appreciate what you've done for us. And the amount of support that we've gotten since then is, it's, it's crazy. Like, we, oh, it's crazy. Uh, 
I, I think we will make it <laughs> because of, of how we've been supported. But there again, that's only if this thing has a deadline and it's not five months from now. So there needs to be some concrete dates and some promises kept or some relief down the line that says, okay, if we have to do this, here's what we're going to do for you to make sure that you can pay your bills. Because I still owe the city 1600 bucks, and I'm going to call and probably pay tomorrow, guys. But <laughs> <laughs> you have to juggle that stuff around, as any business owner knows. I mean, you have to prioritize what you can and wait until certain things happen so you can prioritize others. And now it's, it's gotten even worse. So all that we're asking is, you know, give us, give us some truth. At least give us a chance to know that, hey, here's, how you, here's where you got to make it and figure out what you got to do to get there. But this open-ended, not knowing what's going on, we can't just continue to borrow money and borrow money and borrow money and then bury ourselves when nothing changes in six months. So, you know, on behalf of hopefully every restaurant in town, just give us some dates and stick to your word and maybe do a little something to help us out. Uh, it doesn't have to be a, a huge hand me freebie, everything else, but just know that we do need a little help when you're taking everything away from us. So again, Mark, Deb, I, I appreciate you guys coming to town and, and sitting and listening and you know, letting us tell you to our stories. And I really hope that, that it doesn't fall on deaf ears. But you know, if, if, you, if you can get in front of them, share some stuff. You know, just, just kind of, there's a human element behind every single one of these businesses. So appreciate everybody that's, that's shared and, and we're all together in this together. So. Keep up the good fight. Thank you. Oh, no. <laughs> That's not an encouraging comment. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dale Helms, and he's seen this from three perspectives. He has triangle coach services. How do you move people when nobody can, can get together in some place? How do you move people when you have to scrub the bus down every time between, between uses? Uh, how do you move people when the businesses they're supposed to be going to are closed so there's nobody to be moved? And he's still supposed to survive and be available so when we have to send when we open up and we have teams going to hockey tournaments, for example, is he still going to be there for us? But he also is a member of the city council. So we've seen this from the city council perspective. And he's one of the city council representatives on the EDA. So we've seen it from the EDA perspective as the EDA deals with loans and grants for, through the CARES Act dollars. So he's been helping us with all of those things. So he has three unique perspectives to share with you right now. All yours, Dale. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, folks. I asked them to put me toward the end because I got about a 45-minute speech, but I'll make it quick. Oh. I'm not going to be like, I won't, I won't be like the mayor. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Hey, 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 hey. I'm just, I'm just joking around. But yes, I, I have. I also sit on the library board, uh, East Grand Forks Library Board, and I have to tell you that the East Grand Forks Library is thriving right now because there's nothing else for people to do. And they're thriving for it because they go to the library, they get books, they do, you know, get online they do whatever they can do uh, they're doing their social distance thing and everything over there they're doing their job well and as Paul said I have I do sit on the EDA board and the EDA has done everything that they could possibly do um, and I think we're even going to try a little bit more if we can that's the plan won't, won't pardon the clock tomorrow, morning. tomorrow morning we're going to try and do a little bit more it's, it's, it's the same thing. It's not a lot. We're not here. We can't make everybody whole, although we'd like to. We can't do it. So, and then as far as the council, uh, the council is doing everything to the mayor's, you know, he's, he's East Grand Forks. He always has been. <laughs> so, yeah. And I've always been in East Grand Forks, and, and uh, I try to do as much as I can over here. But, 
in my line of business, um, a lot of that stuff can't, I can't do a lot of things over here like with my buses and stuff because they're, they're, a, um, they're in a line of their own so I have to do other, make other plans. But anyway, as you all know, a lot of Minnesota businesses have been severely impacted since the COVID-19 pandemic hit, has hit our area. Lifetime family businesses that have been around for generations are struggling or have, or have had to close their doors due to reduced business or forced to have no business at all due to our governor's mandating it. Unfortunately, monthly bills for day-to-day -day activities still come in. Insurances still have to be paid. And banks and financial institutions still want their money and paid back to them as well. And it isn't just the lifetime family businesses that have been around for generations that have had, had effect, had, has had been affected. Brand new businesses that opened up in our city by young entrepreneurs that had a dream of owning their own businesses have had to close their doors, their hopes and dreams shattered because of this shutdown. I, for one, can attest to this. As the owner of Triangle Coach Service, a charter bus business here in East Grand Forks, I'm on the verge of losing my business. My company that I've worked so hard for, for the past eight years, I've owned it. Triangle has been around since the 1930s, providing transportation services to everyone around the area, from school kids, college kids, vacation destinations. Triangle has always been there for wherever and whenever the people wanted to travel. In March of this year, we were setting up for the busiest year since we took over ownership of the company. We had trips booked out on our schedule months in advance, contracts that were awarded to us for guaranteed business and lots of bids and quotes to people and businesses wanting to use us for their travel needs. Then COVID hit. All of our trips come to a screeching halt. Unlike bars and restaurants, uh, restaurants are able to do curbside service, or takeout, delivery, whatever. I did nothing. My wheels did not roll. All of our contracts were put on hold. What was once a very biz busy business with having seven to nine buses out daily transporting people all over the tri-state area is immediately shut down with all the buses parked indefinitely. As time goes on and the school year for the fall of 2020 starts to get closer, states have different rules and regulations they want their citizens to follow regarding the COVID pandemic. Our governor here in Minnesota tightened rules and regulations up regarding what can be open and what cannot when closing down restaurants and bars, fitness centers, and having kids stay home from school. North Dakota governors with our neighboring city of Grand Forks didn't have a a, such a strict restriction as Minnesota. Restaurants could still have people, but with less seats to provide social distancing. Bars were allowed to, to be open, schools were still allowed to have sports. This helped me out a little bit as I was able to run a few buses for transportation purposes in Grand Forks. With that being said, a lot of people from East Grand Forks here went over the bridge to Grand Forks to eat at a restaurant, get their hair cut, and all the stuff they could no longer do here in East Grand Forks. There are so many people hurting, and so many jobs, businesses, on the brink of closing for good in East Grand Forks, Minnesota, if something doesn't happen very, very soon. And I'm one of them. Just in a private motor coach industry around the country, since COVID has hit, there have been many businesses that have closed their doors already because they couldn't get help financially, and there is an estimated 80,000 plus jobs that have been lost already. And uh, drivers, mechanics, office personnel are all looking for employment because the charter bus business is closing their doors. 15,000 plus vehicles being repossessed within the next 90 days as owners are unable to make the payments on them due to the lack of work. 1,500 plus companies on the brink of closing their doors forever with no chance of starting over or being able to try and save a long time family business or one they just started. Our federal government gave money and aid to airline industries to cover costs due to the lack of business because of the pandemic. The cruise ships got help, 
when they could not carry passengers on them anymore, Amtrak received aid from our government to help them out. Where is the help for our motor coach industry? Absolutely none. Our, who gets called in harm's way when citizens need to be evacuated from their homes when a hurricane strikes land? Who gets called to transport the National Guard from place to place in a time of need? Even when our president elects senators and congressmen and women are campaigning around our great nation, they use a charter bus. Mm -hmm. The charter bus industry is the second largest transportation industry in the United States with the airlines being number one. Everybody seems to like figures. I'm going to give you some. Airline industry hauls 700 million people a year. Charter bus business hauls 600 million, pe million people a year. Amtrak is down around that one, two, whatever. Airlines and Amtrak gets bailed out every time something happens. I don't know how many times, they, it's been several times they get bailed out. So, I'm going to give you some interesting facts about Triangle Code Service right now real quick. I haven't said much about it through all this whole thing. I just figured it's my, it's my problem. I'll try and deal with it as best I can. But I'm going to start when I purchased this company eight years ago. Deb, I called you up. I quit the East Grand Forks School District and I bought this company. I called up Deb because I had to get permits. I had to get all kinds of stuff from the state. Okay? Well, every time you call the state, it was obvious to put you off to somebody else. Well, that's their department, not mine. So I called up Deb, and I said, Deb, I need help. I bought this company in 2012. It was 2014 before I could get up and running because of government regulations, before I got everything done. I had one lady down in St. Paul that told me when I had sent my paperwork in, well, you didn't have everything filled out correctly. I said, so why didn't you call and tell me so I could get it done? She says, well, I've been working the counter this last week. So my paperwork's laying on your desk doing nothing. So I, that's when I called Deb and I said, Deb, I need help. What can you do to help me? And she says, let me make a phone call for you. Well, I'm going to tell you exactly how that happened. The next morning, this lady that hadn't called me called me on the phone. And she says, you know, she says, calling your representative doesn't do you any good either. And I told her on the phone, I said, lady, I said, that's where you're wrong because you called me, didn't you? <laughs> so Deb did her job. She called me. And then we finally got things moving. But that's how long it took me to get going. My business, I've owned for, I bought my business in 1960, I'm sorry. I was 60 years old when I bought my business, okay? I quit the school district. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I thought, you know what? I'm going to, it's, it's something I, I, I drove for Triangle part-time when they were open. And I seen the opportunity, and I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for it. So I did. I had to hawk my house and everything else to get it done, but I got it done. I took that company from two buses I bought when I bought the place. I'm running 10, or was running 10. So, and buses aren't cheap, okay? So that means I had to buy eight more buses, and I'm not including the two I bought when I bought the company. Well, the buses, you know, they're $600,000 when you buy a bus brand new, okay? So used ones are pretty high. So anyway, what I'm trying to tell you is that my company was my retirement. I was not smart when I was young. I didn't save uh, for retirement. I had, you know, every job I had, I had to raise a family of five children. It took every penny I had to keep them going. It was my retirement. And then my daughter came in to work for me. Now I have two of them working for me. I was going to just turn it over to them. They do a great job. My business right now, I have a million dollar loan on it with buses and everything. And to break it down to you, that's $20,000 a month payment for eight years. 
and then just to be shut down like this. It's horrible. I think right now I might survive until the middle of January. I just had a phone call two days, or actually I got an email today from Mayville State College, which is a contract we just got this year. And they said, as bad as we hate to inform you of this, they canceled the rest of their trips for the rest of this month because of COVID. I do have a little bit of light in the tunnel if North Dakota governor doesn't change things. I got a nice email from Grand Fork Schools. It said, we're back. So I got some trips booked next week for Grand Fork Schools. Again, with the COVID, that could change daily. We don't know what's going to happen. So that's why I'm very upset. I would hope that you people would go back and remove that emergency order from the governor so he can't pull this stuff on us anymore. Put your big boy pants on and get it done because it's, we, we can't survive any longer like we are. And as you probably heard on the news today that there was a council member that stopped at the boardwalk and that was me. I stopped to ask Jane, I said, what are you thinking? And her remark to me was, as I think uh, Barry read in her letter, she said, the outcome is the same. I either sit here and do nothing and go broke, or I open it up and hope I can stay open and make things work. And I said, I'm behind you. So, I hope we can do that with the rest of these restaurants. And as I said before, uh, the EDA and the city council is going to do as much as they can do, but we don't have the money to make everybody whole. We can't do it as bad as we like to. So, and then I have a couple facts. I haven't heard anybody talk about this, but I got a paper here from Polk County, Minnesota, uh, coronavirus cases and deaths. And this is since December 7th, and I don't have anything current. This is December 7th. New known cases in Polk County is 21. 21 cases, okay? You can get this right off the internet if everybody thinks I'm lying, okay? The seven day average for deaths, zero. We're not like Minneapolis, St. Paul. And I get tired of them comparing us to that. We need to be left alone, let us do our thing. We're smart enough people to handle it. The worst thing in the world that was done when they gave that executive order because they took everybody's life right out of them. They put it in one person's hand. It needs to be removed. We need to get opened up. I rest my case. <laughs> Sandy, you've been waiting a long time. Are you still there? There she is. I'm here. We let you be the cleanup hitter. We, you know that, don't you? Okay. Because you have okay. a compelling That's... story. We've talked about it you know, several times. You have so Here much to share about how the impact. Yeah. This is Sandy Locke. Um, and when, when she is done, he'll, he will oh, go. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, you're not clean up anymore. Okay, that's Next okay. Sandy has Bully yeah. Brew. She has stores in East Grand Forks and in Grand Forks and other places. And she's trying to juggle by what's happening at each place and she can tell you about what she's been going through. And it's, it's just an amazing story how she's been able to keep things going. So, Sandy, over to you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Well, as Paul said, I have own, I own Bully Brew Coffee, and uh, I purchased it from the infamous Bob Moore, uh, who has been incredible and I adore. Um, I purchased it in October of 2018, and I remember during that time 
Um, first of all, Bob was so supportive, and that's just uh, obviously he's been supportive to many of us in the room there and, and online. But um, I remember just being so excited for this opportunity, and it'll be the first real estate that I owned. And um, he continued to tell me, you know, smartest decision. It is one of the smartest decisions. And I agreed with him, and my mentors all said the same thing. I was excited to do it, excited to develop a presence in East Grand Forks. And quite honestly, East Grand Forks, the community has been so supportive. Teachers are supportive. Um, they come through the drive through Often small business owners would have meetings inside the dine-in when we'd have it open. Um, loyal groups of retired people would come in and uh, th every Thursday morning and Friday morning and, and sit in their um, table and have coffee. And you could just tell that, you know, we were really necessary in the community. I have an absolutely amazing manager over there who's from East Grand Forks. And, and so I felt like, you know, this has been just an incredible thing for us. Um, however, and, you know, I, I'll also give credit to the city of East Grand Forks because we really have been supported by you in many different ways, even before COVID. But, you know, Paul has been wonderful, wonderful. He's really been great for me to... He, I think he's heard a lot of stories. So when he tells you that, that's because we've been on the phone and I've told him a lot of stories um, and he's listened to all of them. So, but I, the one thing that I struggle with is through all of this passion and all of this great opportunity, it hasn't been able to fix the loss of sales. Um, this particular year, the loss of sales in the East Grand Forks store has been 40%. And uh, since the closure um, of the inside dining, we've lost 45%. So I'm really lucky I can have the drive-thru open and people can come through the drive-thru and I beg for lines because, um, you know, I always see the lines in all of the big corporate coffee houses and I'm, I'm a jealous person and, I'm, and I heard someone earlier saying how they go to other locations and look at parking lots and get mad. And I, oh man, I am right there because I drive by and I'm like, I can't even look at it because um, I get upset. But you know, in East Grand Forks, the support is there. People wait and they'll be patient and they're in line. Um, however, because of the shutdown, it doesn't help us with some of the loss. And also probably more important to me, the loss of people um, as I said, I have a full-time manager, and so we've been able to keep her. We have eight people that are part-time. And, you know, somebody had said to me just a while ago and said, you know, at least you don't have a lot of people who support their family and, you know, have a lot of bills. And I said, no, wait a minute. You're discrediting these college students who they work at Bully Brew to pay their bills. And some of them don't have mom and dads that pay their bills. And so now suddenly, you know, instead of their 30 hours a week, they get five or they get six and it's not enough to pay their bills. So I don't discredit those part-time people. And I think that's something that a lot of, you know, a lot of us don't think of that there's many people, including um, the students who are being affected because they can't afford their bills. And then I go on our behalf and, you know, my heart breaks for all of you. I, I hate hearing these stories. And I think one of the most important pieces that I try to explain to those who don't own businesses is the small business owner is a little bit different than corporates or, you know, the, the larger companies, because a lot of us have SBA loans. And I've only been there for two years. And Bob, it was the greatest thing. And it is the greatest thing. And I, I do love that place. Um, it has a, a huge place in my heart. But because of only being there for two years, I do have an, a large SBA loan. Well, with that large SBA loan, uh, my house is a personal guarantee. So, you know, when people say, well, if you have to shut down, you have to shut down. I'm like, no, you don't get it. I can't just shut down because I will lose my house. I don't have that opportunity just to say, um, 
you know, I, like busy pennies, I'm going to bankrupt and I'm just going to, you know, start over new. Uh, that doesn't work in a small business because of the personal guarantees. And so I, I want to try and educate people so they understand why it is important for all of us to remember to, you know, shop small and, and think about the small business owner because we do have a, a lot more invested in our, in our company, not just our own work and our own time and effort. So uh, I won't be long and I do thank you very much for listening and I hope you do bring this message and bring all of these message forward. I guess my request would be, you know, let us open those doors and, you know, open up dining rooms and open up, you know, the restaurants so that we can be safe and we can provide for those people that feel comfortable coming in. If, if someone is not feeling comfortable to come in, um, I urge them to you know, not do that, either pick up you know, on the curbside or drive-throughs, but there are people who are very comfortable coming in and I want to be able to serve them in a safe way. So I, I urge that you do help us uh, request that. So thank you very much. And my heart goes out to all of you who are small business owners. And, um, and thank you for those of you who have put out lots of support. So thank you. I'm going to say go. He's going to go up. Yeah. I'm down. I've lost about six hundred thousand in revenue so far. And I've laid off so many people. Uh Pat Bopre at the Blue Moose. Um I started there as a bus boy at fifteen and bought the business with my partner Nate ten years ago and it's been in business for twenty five years and it's I, I love it. It's the restaurant industry is like the best thing in the world. Um, you get to have a great community around us and the support has been great and thank you all for putting this on. Thank you for all the stories. It's been pretty crazy. Um, I'll just do some short facts. I actually brought with uh, my unemployment folder for this year. Wow. And this, this year alone, the previous five years, I maybe had five total employees that collected unemployment. We, we employ 100 people. We just laid off 75 of those people during the holiday season. Our average weekly payroll is around 40,000. We cut that down to six. And that six, we're still losing money. You don't make money on takeout food. You keep people employed. Um, another thing, these people that are being laid off, now they can't afford the health insurance. During a pandemic, what are they supposed to do? Um, the serving staff and kitchen staff during this time, the holiday season, um, we do a lot of big parties relying on getting the tips so they can pay their bills during this time. Now they don't have that. Um, with the shutdown that we kind of forget about, it changes people's patterns. When you're coming to a restaurant weekly, like every Tuesday, all of a sudden you can't come there for a month, three months, where do those people go? They go to the other side of the river where they're open. Mm -hmm. um, also at this time, gift cards are a big, big time of year for gift cards. Gift card sales are, are down. And it's understandable because do people know if we're gonna be open? Are we gonna be shut down again? Are we gonna be forced to close the business completely? Um, so it's just, it's a tough time for everyone. And I'm just asking that we can open back up, do it safely. Um, let the people that feel comfortable come in. Those that aren't comfortable, we still offer curbside delivery and all that. Um, that's all I have. So thank you everyone for listening. And
During the meeting, I received an email from Jesse Johnson at Up North Pizza, and I'd like to share that with you. I had asked him if he could attend the meeting tonight, and his response is, unfortunately, no. I'm very short-staffed tonight due to the fact that employees finding jobs and hours on the other side of the river. That was something I did not want to bring up. The fact that not only that not only is our local businesses suffering, our local restaurant staff are suffering too. Although it ultimately falls back on us, uh, onto the restaurant, I, like most restaurants, will probably need to hire new employees and in a way kind of start from scratch, which is easier said than done. Uh, our unemployment rate up here has been about 4% which is significantly below what the state unemployment rate is. And so when there's demand for people, and when we lose them, when Pat and Nate lose them, when, when Justin loses them, we don't get them back. So also the state does not have any set plan in place or is working on one to help out restaurants, gyms, theaters, etc., such as tax relief, grant program, state-sanctioned PPP type loan, rainy day fund. This pandemic has taken an extreme toll on every business that has had to shut the doors. Not talking about big business, strictly small business. If most are like up north pizza, that's 80% of the sales taken away from those four months of shutdown. Not to mention that sales were not close to what they usually are when we are allowed to open during the summer months. Thanks, Jesse Johnson at Up North Pizza. <laughs> Mayor, yep. your turn. Okay. I get to bug out on this one a little bit. Thank you very much. Thank you. You bet. We really are blessed to have two people in the legislature from our area who are engaged, who have a tremendous amount of common sense and are willing to look someone in the eye when they are um, probably not doing what they should be doing or what's best for the people that you represent and you'll cut it clean. I know you will. Um, Deb, you've been taking copious amounts of notes. At the end, would you please photocopy those and give them to Mark because he hasn't taken a single note. <laughs> he has a memory. <laughs> This time, if you would come up, Representative Keel, we'd like to hear your response and, and anything else you have to share. Thank you. Thank you. Um, down comes a mask. Not crazy about masks. And um, just by way of a little bit of background, I want you to know that, first of all, I have a spouse that got very, very sick two years ago. And uh, we resided at Altru for over a month. Uh, he got Legionnaires. Legionnaires is similar to... COVID and that it was a moisture product that got in his lungs at a restaurant, came out of a hot tub, actually, we found out, and it is, but it is bacterial. And so when they discovered what it was, we were able to uh, handle it, but his kidneys shut down. So thus the trip to Altru and, and dialysis. He's doing much better now. And uh, so we stay home a little bit, or he stays home a little bit more because of the fear of what he can pick up. So I get all of those concerns. However, I am also a family business. I grew up in a family business, and I, and I am in a family business. Actually, I'm at transition right now. My son is taking over. And we farm, and I grew up on a farm. So that is my background. But I firmly understand what it's like to start a business, take over a business with the hopes and dreams of what you want to do. Or at the end of your business, when you want to transition, government doesn't make it easy anyway. And then to watch it all just blow away in the wind, how difficult that must be because you have no control over what's being done to you. And I, I don't mean to be so sad, but it, it really, I really want you to understand, I really do understand what's going on here. I'm very frustrated. You look at us and say, you're the legislators. Why are you not doing something? I can tell you that the governor does not answer our phone calls, does not interested in talking to us. We have a legislator in the le legislator, um, now we're gonna have two of them that are restaurant owners that have tried, there's a team, and they have been trying really hard to work with the Senate and say, Governor, you've got to stop this. 
You are not, you cannot fix this with government money. We have to get the businesses going. I hear Health and Human Services, I spent the whole day listening to Health and Human Services and all the COVID things and, and, and people are like, don't cut us now, don't cut us. Well, where the hell do you think the tax money is gonna come from? It's all gone. And, I, and I, I think they're right. We're having mental health problems. We're having suicide problems. This is devastating. I watch the senior citizens. I have an 83-year-old father that's, um, they're, my parents are independent to some degree, but they're starting to have problems and they hate this. My dad is furious when he was told he couldn't go to church and he's there. If he can be there, he's there. He doesn't care. And I think that's the bigger message. We need to be independent. Now, Senator Johnson, I don't know what you're going to say about this, but some days I want for us all to say, we're back. We're, we're running, put our kids back in school. I, I spent yesterday evening quite late reading some information that my legislative colleagues shared with me. My daughters both have COVID now and um, 15 grandchildren, 17 grandchildren between them down in Mankato. So they're, you know, dealing with all of this and they've said, it, yeah, we're going to stay home. Yeah, this is like the flu. Yes, it is serious. Yes, people will die from it. As other flus, other things can happen. But I think we need to bond together, not just East Grand Forks, but certainly East Grand Forks, because you're fighting the other side of the river. Um, I've many times since I've been elected told people down in St. Paul, you're forcing our business across the river. And I'm not just talking East Grand Forks. I hear pe from people when they did the c cigarette tax, and I'm not a smoker. But um, I heard from people in Fergus Falls, Alexandria, Roseau, were all driving to East or Grand Forks. Well, of course they weren't going to just get cigarettes. They're going to go out to eat. They're going to grab a few groceries they can't get, maybe in their small communities. They're going to do more of their shopping. We're just shoving it over there, and this is not helping. And you all know this stuff. Um, how do we get the governor's attention? How do we make sure he's not listening to the team that's down there now? They've told me they are just, Dave Baker, who is a restaurateur and a business owner down in Wilmer, said, I am so frustrated. He will not, he, he, he's met with him. He will not talk to us. He does not ask us. He does not know what's going on in our towns. And I would agree. We never should have shut down schools. I, I, I tell you my personal story. My grandson is a hockey player. He's a senior. He's devastated that he can't play. I mean, he, wa he wanted to move into an apartment with his buddies in Grand Forks and go to school at Red River so he could be assured he'd be playing. He went to state and track in so his sophomore year. He's not been able to run since. No, that's, he's a kid and life is gonna change for him. But it is so devastating when I watch these children turn in and say, hey, I've got a problem. I can't do these things. You know, and when, you're, when your almost 18-year-old grandson looks at you and says, Grandma, you're a legislator. Can you fix it? Oh, by golly, I wish I could. I really do. Um, it's close to home, but you all are part of home. And I... This is, this is really frustrating. But I think, and I, I need to let Senator Johnson talk, we need to come up with a plan. Maybe we need to do what Boardwalk is doing. Maybe we need to just say, you know what, we're all opening. I don't know how our law enforcement will view that. Um, but I, I think our businesses have to open up. There's no statistics I know of that exercise places, uh, theaters, there is no statistics that say we will get COVID from that. And if I can go shopping in Target, Walmart, um, and see all of these people, why can't I go to the movie theater or the restaurant? That's my business. I'm an American. I make those choices. If I get sick, I get sick. And I realize we all have to be careful. But this is no more devastating than other diseases we have. And the, I, I, I'm, I'm Mr. Mrs. Happy right now. I really want to be positive, you guys. We have so much going for us. We just need to figure out how we can do this and get, you know, we're, we're feeling very hand-tied at the legislature. And I have to say, I'm a little disappointed because the House of Representatives didn't flip from Democrat to Republican 
because I can assure you that the executive order would have gone away um, November had or if we could have gotten it to vote it probably wouldn't have they wouldn't have voted but I can assure you it would have gone away by January because the Senate and the House would have gotten together and said we'll do something different they're telling us we can't even I, I you need to know we're not down there we're we go down once in a while for meetings most of the time I'm sitting in my office at my house and I'm voting online in my phone um, and panicking because my phone dropped a call and I'm supposed to vote and and those kinds of things are going on so there is some real I mean Minnesota needs to get a hold of this and get back to you know and rural Minnesota for sure I mean we're you like you said we're different and we are so anyway I, I don't have any answers but I'm open to anything you guys have an idea for and I'd be glad to work with it so thank you The, the very fact of you being here, the very fact of you being here is a statement that this is a big deal and, and your engagement, it's a big deal. So thank you. Absolutely. And by the way, my cell phone number is open to all of you. You want to call me directly. I, it's so hard. St. Paul, my office calls me or texts me every day. Hey, Deb, here are the things you need to do. She's not allowed in the office. She works from home. So we work, coordinate things, but if you want my cell phone number, I'm more than glad to share it with you. It's 280-1452, and you come ask me afterward if you'd like. She does answer. She does. <laughs> <laughs> now, if we're going to play good legislator, bad legislator, uh, Senator Johnson, you got to be the bad legislator. Oh, so. man. Well, I thought he was going to be the guy with the snap finger. Oh, settled. Yeah. Well, he is in charge. I mean, the oh, Senate is in charge. Whoa. <laughs> Not quite, right, Mark? <laughs> Not, yeah. So first of all, I'd like to thank the mayor and uh, Paul, Gordy, and then Barry for really organizing this event tonight. This has really been uh, one of the most impactful meetings that I have uh, really ever been in uh, from my perspective of being in the Senate. Um, you know, you, you brought up the, the, I didn't have notes with the lawyer without having a pen and paper. I'm sitting back there shaking right now trying to write something and I can't. So if I didn't uh, have my wife who's on the screen here, you know, I probably wouldn't be walking around with pants on right now. So uh, I'm kind of forgetful. Yes. So, but I really appreciate you making the time to come out here and do this. Each one of you have had an impact in my life. I think about Bob, I think, you know, the movies that uh, my wife and I went to while well, we were dating and we're at your theaters. Uh, you know, you guys, our, our life group, our Bible study group, we always do our Christmas party over there uh, at the Blue Moose and, and spend time and fellowship over there and what a, just the memories that, would, that have been created at, at your place. And we were there opening over at your place at the Spot Junior and got to uh, see that unique menu and uh, really had a, a wonderful time. And, and Sandy, I think when, when Jordan sees me trotting across from my office over to Bully Brew there, she has a small cup of coffee ready for me and I have a $1.94 ready to give her. So she knows <laughs> I'm, what I'm there for. So I appreciate this. You know, to see the impact that one man has on our community uh, I, I can't imagine when you look around and you see what our community is going to look like if this continues. No Blue Moose, no Mike's Pizza, you know, no Triangle Travel. I see that Norski's bus running all over the place, you know, before the COVID here. And, shut down all their chiefs. Yeah. You know, what's going what's gonna to be the face of East Grand Forks after this uh, occurs? Now, we spend nearly uh, half of our budget, 48% on education in this state. And if a $50 billion budget is what we have, then you can do the math on that. That They're trying to teach minds on critical thinking and, and being able to be responsible. And if we're not able to do that individually, the governor's really patronizing us, saying, we'll take care of you. You're not smart enough to make the decisions that you need to make in your life. If you're at risk, if Lon's at risk of going to the restaurant and getting this you know, virus, maybe he shouldn't be going there. But that shouldn't be a punishment on our establishments that they have no data on, that it's gonna, it's gonna have this huge effect saving thousands of lives we hear over and over again. I am sick of that. 
I've been sick of that since this began. The governor took the 1231 emergency peacetime powers, and that was to prepare our communities to be able to handle the virus or the, the, whatever effects of that virus were coming. The federal government's given them $2.1 billion to prepare our communities, our local governments, our, our counties, our school districts. Uh, we have given him 200 and some million dollars to do that too, and yet he continues to do this, and he does not hear the message that's coming through it. And yet he says, I understand, folks, and somebody brought it up. It might have been, I don't know, was it you that, that brought it up, Nate, that said, you know, what paycheck has he missed? Mm -hmm. Yet he understands. Don't worry. Mm -mm. Don't worry, he understands that, that you're going to lose a million dollars worth of business. He doesn't care, Bob, if, if, your, if your business goes under there in the theater, but he understands you. Yeah, right. and that makes me so upset to hear that yeah. they have no skin in this game. So I appreciate you coming here today. I will offer a little ray of hope uh, that we are working very hard on at the Senate right now. And it's a deal, uh, looks like it's around $200 million, which sounds like a lot, but as we discussed earlier, I mean, $200 million disappears really fast. But that's on uh, a couple of different things for businesses, restaurants, those that were affected in this. Uh, and I'm sorry, I don't think it would help uh, Councilman on, on transportation, but it looks like it would be things that would be affected by the, the Executive Order 99 that, that really shut down our restaurants and gyms and, and those facilities. Uh, there might be some help coming there. We'll see if we can reach a deal here before Monday on that uh, that deal. It would also help on some unemployment. What's that? It probably won't help for Ben either, right? May not help for Ben open. either. But it, you know, and that's the problem with this. So now government is beginning to pick and choose which businesses are going to survive and which aren't. You know, that's one of the things that I've been very uh, vocal about in supporting Christy Nome, uh, the governor of South Dakota, on her approach to it is allowing individuals to make those decisions that affect their lives. And yes, they've seen a, a spike in, in cases in different areas, but at the same time, they've also been able to kind of control on, on businesses and, and, and what, what their economy looks like. And I think that's a much better approach. So one of the things, and I, again, forgot, uh, was my cell phone. So as I was sitting here, I was gonna text the governor and tell him about what we've been talking about and what East Grand Forks is going to be looking like uh, after this. And if he continues this um, you know, exercise of peacetime powers and the Executive Order 99, what the face of East Grand Forks is going to look like. And once I get home and find my phone, uh, that's exactly what I'm going to be texting him. So, yeah. Just real quick to address the elephant in the room, what are we doing with Boardwalk? I mean, we got them up and running making money right now. You know what I mean? Um, I suppose we should probably go over there and have supper. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so Nothing else, have a beer. You know, can we talk suit? What, what is the mayor? You know, what do you got a few deck for that? You know, like, um, you know, if, if all of us. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's all. Oh, no. You, you're good? I, I'm good. Okay, wait, before you, you leave. Start the show. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Johnson. One, one of my concerns is, is this money you're talking about is getting that money up this way that we need because I know how fast it gets burnt up down in the city's area. Yeah. Are you going to assure these people? Um, obviously, like you said, I'm out of luck, and that's the way it's been with the government all along. Yeah. Um, is there any way you can assure these people that some of that money will get this way? So one of the things that we've been seeing, right, is like our Targets and our Walmarts and our, you know, McDonald's and all those types of places that have been having really just heydays mm -hmm. making money. Um, we're trying to make sure that those are the types of businesses that are excluded. So that pot of money is for those businesses that are small and have really been affected. So places where 35% or more of their revenues have been impacted by this. So, or a 35% drop in revenue. So that's, I mean, that fits exactly, um, you know, these types of small businesses. And that's what we're aiming at. So I don't know if that, that would help. I know that still there's a larger population of those businesses down in Hennepin and Ramsey counties, but I'm sure hoping that that pot will stay large enough to come up to Northwest Minnesota. And that's balanced, right? That is balanced. I haven't seen how I, they're yeah. geographically balancing it yet. No, and I haven't seen anything either. I know we're working on it, but yeah. So Question yeah. about Thank you. the boardwalk. Um, 
First, I would say, this is what a business does when you push it into the corner. When it's in a fight for its very survival, and it's, it's really in, in desperate situation of maybe even not being able to go forward, this is the response you're gonna get. It should not surprise anyone that when you force someone into the corner, that this is what's gonna happen. Nobody should be surprised by that. We're all honored. We're all there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Now, I will say that I've been in conversation with Chief Headland through the afternoon um, and in a fairly proactive way, our Attorney General's office reached out to him after the Facebook post by the boardwalk, along with Minnesota Department of Health, and both of them have gotten in ahead of their trying to open and saying, by the way, here's what we expect of you from a local law enforcement standpoint. This, 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 and starting to dictate to our local police chief what's expected. Now, we have some choices, of course, we can, we can follow their directive or not. Um, and there are always consequences if you do and if there are consequences if you don't. Um, we chose to, to go in there to issue the reminder that they are in violation, to bring in the executive order to say part of the executive order includes the provision for penalty. And this is what the penalty looks like. <coughs> bing, 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 in detail. Um, we're going to convene tonight, actually, the council president, our city attorney, our chief of police, and I to plan our next steps. We, we got that far. Um, we could have taken the hard line. The uh, AG requested that we seriously consider dropping a citation on them right out of the chute. We asked for the opportunity to educate. The same as you would want, you would want, you would want to say this is very serious. If, there, if it continues on, um, of course, if it goes into litigation, it gets very expensive and not, not good. So if there's a way to, to short circuit that, if there's a way to get this taken care of without that. And nowhere in here am I saying that, that um, anybody's unreasonable because again, when you're in a fight for your survival, these are the kinds of things that people should expect. So um, I know that I, I kind of dance around it, but that's as factual as I can be. So just a, just a kind of go on top of what Nate asked then. I know we might not even be able to hear an exact uh, answer to the question, but let's say we walk out of here, the two of us, and we get a hold of Chris and we say, yeah, we're all doing it. Just about everybody's gonna do it. What can the state do to the city if you chose not to fully enforce it to the- Have them step up to I a mean, mic. You can take the liquor license away for their unit. But is, is it withholding funding from the city? Oh. Which would... The question somebody, was- Somebody asked you to step up to the mic. Yeah, can't hear you I'll, I'll try to restate the question. The question was yeah. is, what if the restaurants in the area all banded together and decided to reopen in violation of the executive order? What would be the fallout to the city? And perhaps even what would be the fallout to you guys? Right. Well, we should call that an autonomous zone. And I think we'll be okay. <laughs> you know, yeah, why not? We're protesting. So. Oh, goodness. That does sound good, doesn't we it? We have a right to do so. that. I think so. Wow. Um, but that was, always my, that was always my thought even during the first shutdown. Pat and I even floated the idea of it. Obviously, at a certain point, you know, whether you guys supported us on a personal level or not, you had to take a stand as a city. So with that being said, are there financial withholdings that the state could do to impact us on a local level? even immediately, if, if not immediately within the next six months, that could obviously financially burden the city as a whole, that would make our decision a lot different. But These are good businesses. I'll just say it publicly. The very fact that you have a thought toward, you know, what's the fallout on, on us as a city government, as our community, tells me where your heart is and it's in the right place. I'm gonna say this, um, don't worry about that. You do what you need to do. However, I will say that coming down from the AG and at the state level, you can expect an enforcement effort the likes of which you've never seen. Mm -hmm. It would be upon you swiftly and like a ton of bricks, and, it, and it, would, it would not be a good thing. But you guys work it out and do what you have to do. Um, from our standpoint, I would say hang in there. Let's see what they can do in their special session. Let's see what we can do for some special funding. And I, I have a little wrap up planned for the end. We're going to hear from our council president here in a minute. Um, and yet, if you all decide to go, uh, I respect that decision. If you all decide to go, um, don't worry about bringing any bad upon the city of East Grand Forks. You do what you need to do. If you ask me my humble opinion, I'd say hang in there. Let's try to work through the proper channel. Hang in there as long as you can. 
and um, and we'll see if we can get something pulled together the, at the very very least which I'll hopefully touch on at the end this can't be extended this cannot be extended there is no way that a government check can can touch the lives of every single person affected by this shutdown it ripples out to your vendors it ripples out to me a customer of your places it ripples out to pick one there's no way that the government can in its infinite wisdom can figure out who all is harmed by this because what y'all do it ripples out into the economy all over the place so that's what I would say um, don't worry about the fallout to us as a council don't worry about any of that do what's right for your business to your own good judgment and if you can hang in there hang in there president Olstead please Thank you, Mayor. Um, kind of just piggyback on what Mayor Gantner said. I, I think don't worry about us at all. I mean, uh, St. Paul's hurt us enough in the last couple of years with LGA, so we figure out a way how to do it and work with uh, what we have and how we can take care of everybody and the, citizen, the citizens here. So, but I, I, one thing I wanted to say, and the only reason why I asked uh, the mayor for me to speak is I wanted to come up and say thanks for coming tonight. and and telling your story and getting in front of you know mr johnson and Ms. keel and just saying we need to do something we need to be done with this uh, we say it all the time we talk and we've had working groups and we're trying to figure out how we can help everyone and it's just mind-boggling how they can keep extending this out and keep pushing us and trying to figure out how can we keep you know doing this to our businesses it's just you know drives me crazy and I, I, I want, you know, today I, I ordered food from you guys today from Blue Moose, you know, I was at, I work from home. I'm not even in my office, so, but I, you know, and we try to do as much as we can and we talk about it, you know, last night, Mr. Vetter brought food in from you and it, I mean, we all know and we wish we could go watch a movie, you know, uh, you know, and, and I have gift cards there I want to use, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, and hearing new businesses that are in the city that, you know, are in the River Cinema, in the mall there, I just, the mayor and I talk a lot and we go back and forth and we kind of maybe get on each other's nerves and, you know, argue back and forth of what we can do and what we can't do. and. Try to get EDA, can we get money out of there? Well, we can't do that, it's illegal. We can't give money away, you know? And it, it's frustrating for us to have only so much to give out and so much we can do legally, and that's what drives us nuts, where St. Paul could just say we're done. You know, Governor Wallace can you know, be done with the orders, you know, and, you, and I hope you guys can get that through his mind down there next week and uh, stop everything, so. That's all I wanted to say. So appreciate everybody. Appreciate you coming tonight. Um, you know, we'll I had a choice between his money or opening. I'll take opening. Yep. Yep. Right. Stick his yeah. money wherever. Yeah. So I'm going to wrap it up. I'll just take another minute or two. Um, real quick, I'm going to circle back. Gary, are you with us? I'm right here. I'm out of the room. Gary. 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 Gary's still here? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, I just want you to know, Gary, um, I had lunch today with Barry Wilford, and when Barry speaks candidly, he is as livid as we are. <laughs> when he speaks yes. candidly, and when he gets to the policy makers, he will be as livid as we are. Mm -hmm. I guarantee it. Right now, he's keeping the gloves on, and there's a reason for that but Barry's moving up in the Minnesota chamber right now and uh, and he's become a uh, he, he's bringing in the collaboration of all of our communities and so the, the very fact that we're doing this it, sure enough some of us had the idea to do it and Barry immediately fanned the flames he said this is how it happens and I thank you to everyone in the media picking this up because this is how it happens. It shows up in the paper, it shows up in talk radio, it runs back to St. Paul and at the grassroots level, where it matters, it gets back. And, and Barry had a lot to do with fanning those flames. So when he is speaking candidly, he's as livid about this as anyone in the room. I promise you that. 
Thank you, Steve. Steve. Many times, Mayor. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Steve. Yep. Um, I don't want you to think I was picking on Barry, and I say that because I want to go back to what Ms. Keel said. This is political, isn't it? Did Deb not say that if we had Republicans in there, this would not be happening? Yes or no? This absolutely has a political yes. political okay. uh, over so, overlay. So, it's a real virus, but it's political. Yeah. Okay, so nobody's feelings should be getting hurt. I cut through the chase because I wanted everybody to speak because they're in the trenches. I'm an investor that came in and try, that's trying to save a club that's been around since the 1800s, Steve. So, I, I, thank you for doing that. I was so glad to hear that it came back gangbusters with and, all kind of barbecue look, stuff. We have to make lemonade out of lemons, but here's the deal. If it's political, because our chamber merged, I've owned businesses in Grand Forks since 1976. And because our chamber has merged, it's tough to have a voice when you're representing people across the river that are thriving because the Minnesota businesses are closed. Barry's in a tough position. He I is. respect Barry. Yeah. The bottom line is this. If we're going to get this done, we got to march our asses down there. We've got to be vocal because if it's political, they're going to listen to our stories and they're going to go home and they're going to enjoy the luxury of life that they've lived. Look, the bottom line is, is we need to take our stories and we need to go down there and fight and fight and fight. And they need to understand this fight. Jane Moss is making a statement for all of us. If we all open up our businesses, we know the ramifications. Jane is making a statement. Go over there, Barry. Go over there, Mr. Gander. Everybody go over there and take your pictures over there. Because the only way that Mr. Waltz is going to understand the plight that we're in is if we truly show him how desperate people are. And on closure, Jane told me today the reason why she's doing this is because people are desperate. Thank yep. you. Absolutely. Thank Gary, you so much. Gary, I know where we can get a bus. We want to take a bus load down there. <laughs> I wish all of you a very Merry Christmas and God bless you all. Thank you. And when it comes to Sandy Luck and everybody in the community, the, the Spud Jr., I could not be more proud of being a Grand Forks citizen and watching how Sandy and everybody has united our community with other businesses. They are to be commended. Sandy, you're the one that's in the trenches and everybody else in this room is in the trenches. And my heart goes out to you guys, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. My passion, my passion comes from my heart. And I just want to say in conclusion that if we do not extend that passion, Mr. Waltz will never get it. And again, God bless you and thank you. Thank you again. Um, Representative Keel, thank you again for making the trip. Senator Johnson, thank you for making the trip. Um, thank you for really, I think, as you said, this it's very personally impactful. You will walk this down and anyone who will listen, you're going to bring everything you got in this room back down there with you. Um, and I know hearing from every business owner and, and I'm there, you have your heart and soul in these businesses. These are not, you know, like profit centers that you show up and, and put in some time in the adult. No, this is your heart and soul that you have invested into these businesses. Every single one in this room, everybody out there, everybody back here. And, um, and I just, I say thank you because that's what keeps you hanging on. When common sense and business savvy say, probably time to walk away. You know, how much debt do you wanna have before you say enough's enough? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, coming out of the flood of 97, I hate to bring up a flood story, but Buddy and I just made our first foray into real estate. We bought a fourplex three months before the flood hit. Oh. Two units destroyed in the middle of town. We're upside down. We owe more on it than it's worth. It didn't even, I mean, thank the good Lord, it didn't cross our minds right then to walk away because you had your heart and soul, you invested, you had a vision for a business that wasn't just a fourplex, it was much more. So you hang in there, you, you ride through the trough, you fight, you scramble, and then you come out the other side. Boy, and I've been there plenty of times in lots of different ways. So... By all means, I hear the passion, I hear 
the very, very personal aspect of this, and, and I look forward to, you know, all of us working together to get through it, climb out of it, uh, get back to good days ahead. It's coming. So. We do, we do need to show Governor Walz that we are stronger than he thinks. Yeah. So my final message to Governor Walz, on behalf of our community, I have just these four little simple requests. One, distribute aid immediately to businesses affected by Executive Order 2099. Number two, in the future, if you call upon one small sector of our economy to bear the load for the greater good, fund them before you shut them down. Don't wait four days to say you're going to try to find the money. Find the money before you shut them down. Allocate the money before you shut them down. That's how you do it. You don't break ground on a house before you have the thing financed. And you don't shut a business down for the greater good without money to make sure they get through it. Number three, if you all are keeping track, please do not under any circumstances extend this Executive Order 2099 past December the 18th. New cases of COVID-19 have been dropping in all the states around us and in Minnesota for more than three weeks. So there is no need to extend it. Extending it would be a death sentence to a lot of great businesses, costing a lot of jobs in our community, inflicting a lot of hardship on families. Just don't go there. Fourth and finally, this is a bit of an aside, any law that prohibits celebrating Christmas with extended family and friends is wrong. It can be a suggestion, it can be a recommendation, it can be a request, but can't be a law. Given the facts, people will do the right thing for themselves and for those they love. That's all I got. Thanks. Oh, you got a battle plan going? <laughs> we'll wait and see whether or not they extend it. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, no, no, appreciate that.